colorful uniforms and so forth. It's really an incredible sight. It's a sight made all the more awesome when you consider the beginnings of professional football and the men who played it way back when. So today on the first half of our show, we're going to take a little trip down memory lane in search of pro football's roots. With Burt Lancaster as our narrator, we'll take a look at a film that was made to commemorate the first 50 years of the NFL. We'll see the small towns and the big men like Jim Thorpe, Johnny Blood, Red Grange, Sammy Baugh, and Johnny Unitas, who gave pro football its character and its legends. And through this journey into history, perhaps we'll understand why football has become big game America, a game that has changed greatly over the years, but a game that's still played by a special kind of man. It takes, a, I think, a different breed of cat to, to play uh, pro football. I've always told the uh, new fellows coming in that you've got to be just a little bit crazy to play professional football. Here we go, John. A mood look, John. Good, John. Even a little more out to sea, John. Beautiful, John. Don Merida is a different breed of cat. Of He's shot, not a hunter, yeah. but a lover. Yeah, like you're really a lover of the game he plays and of the opportunities it has given him. Good, John. And you're really looking, Don. Beautiful, Don. That's a shot, Don. Good. Great. Think about it, John. Beautiful, it. Don. Good. Don. Beautiful. Good. Professional football is a violent game of physical contact played by a conglomeration of misfits. Not misfit in that the guy can't do anything else or he doesn't belong anywhere else, but misfits in that this guy is a misfit in a positive point of view, that he's, uh, he's something kind of special. Not that uh, he's better than anyone else, it's just special. It's a special talent. Special men in a special game. A uniquely American game with a history as rich and as rugged as the country in which it was born. Thursday the 4th, 7.30 a.m., Man and Mirror looks old. Pro football was forged in the steel and coal towns of the 1890s. Mining trapped a hardy race of men indoors, and football became the only escape from a gray life of boredom and misery. Town teams were formed, rivalries flamed, Victory became vital at any cost. In 1915, Canton, Ohio organized a pro team, and to ensure victory, the promoters signed the most famous athlete in the land. He was called Bright Path by his Indian mother, but was known to millions as Jim Thorpe. In the 1912 Olympics in Stockholm, he scored more points than did whole nations. King Gustav of Sweden proclaimed him the greatest athlete in the world. But football was Jim's favorite sport, and his name gave the pros their admittance to the national scene. In the next few years, more stars came. Men like John McNally, a wild young man who left the Notre Dame campus in search of excitement and found it in pro football as Johnny Blood. En route to some forbidden pro ball, he saw a movie marquee. That day, Johnny Blood took the field for the Green Bay Packers, and Blood ran on and on for 15 seasons. Thorpe and Blood gave a prestige and a style to pro football. George Hallis gave it a foundation from which to grow. In 1918, he lost his position as a right fielder with the New York Yankees to a player named Babe Ruth. Frustrated, Hallis turned to pro football and founded the Chicago Bears. He employed himself as left end, captain, and coach. In 1920, he founded the National Football League and guided the game into the Roaring Twenties. In football, it was Red Grange, a college halfback from Illinois. And perhaps more than any other athlete, he was thoroughly a product of his time. 
Like Houdini, he was the great escape artist. Like Douglas Fairbanks, he was the swashbuckling adventurer who always evaded capture. Like Max Sennett, he was the artful dodger, leading his pursuers a comic chase. He was Red Grange, the galloping ghost. In 1925, he turned pro and signed with George Hallis' Chicago Bears. Thousands who had never heard of pro football packed the stadiums to get a glimpse of the ghost. Grange did more to popularize pro football than any other player before or since. The next great stride in pro football was taken not by a runner, but an owner. George Preston Marshall of the Washington Redskins believed that football should be entertainment, and that entertainment was a long forward pass accompanied by good music. For the latter, he organized the Redskin Band and provided pro football with its first team song, Hail to the Redskins. As for the forward pass, he hired Sammy Baugh, the most accurate passer in college football. In his rookie season, Slay and Sam led the Redskins to the championship, and his passes signaled the beginning of modern pro football. With the advent of the forward pass, the game left its rough and tumble days. Like the America of the late 30s, pro football hit the assembly line. Every position, every move was studied, practiced, perfected. Someone thought of the T formation and everybody used it. But the defenses caught up with the team, and then for a long while, no one used it. In the 30s, they used complex shifting formations with intricate patterns of deception. Only one stubborn man in Chicago stuck with the old fashioned T, George Hallis. In 1940, Hallis rebuilt and redesigned his outmoded tee. On a bright and crisp December afternoon in 1940, 36,000 people witnessed the birth of a new era in pro football. Hallis unveiled his renovated tee, and his Bears demolished the Redskins 73 to nothing to win the championship. The Bears' victory was so impressive that every team adopted the explosive tee formation, and players tossed the ball around like vaudeville jugglers. By 1943, the zany tempo of the tea was slow to a march. The military needed men, and pro football went the way of all industry. The 
the Second World War changed the nation and the world and left in its aftermath a violent generation fresh from battle and eager for action. At the control center of the pro-attack was the T quarterback, the dashing commander of Sunday's wars. Otto Graham, number 14, the quarterback of the Cleveland Browns, traveled the paths of glory more often than any quarterback in history. He led the Browns to a title in each of his 10 years in the game. With Norman Van Brocklin, number 11 at quarterback, the Los Angeles Rams scored more points than any team ever in the pro game. Bobby Lane, number 22 of the Detroit Lions, couldn't match Van Brocklin in pure passing skill. Nor was he as polished as Otto Graham. In fact, whatever he did looked difficult rather than easy. But Lane, like the others, was a champion. He was a driving field general who demanded and got the very best his troops had to offer. Like the old soldier, Lane just faded away, playing out the last years of his colorful career with the Pittsburgh Steelers. When the drums of World War II disappeared, pro football changed its beat. Sunday's wars became Sundays with soul. Young black men from small Negro colleges in the South and the West came to the game in a steady stream. There were mountains like 240-pound Marion Motley, number 76, and molehills like 5-foot-4-inch Buddy Young, number 22. Willie Gallimore, number 28, could run 100 yards in 9.6 seconds. And at times, it seemed as though he could do this sideways and backwards as well as forward. Bobby Mitchell, number 49, was strong, quick, and could change directions like a fish. Runners like Mitchell and Gallimore added a new dimension to the old art of carrying a football. The cowboy movies of the late 1950s offered America a new breed of hero. So did pro football. He was the lonesome good guy. The silent sheriff who said little, but did much. Perhaps his name was Gary Cooper. On Sundays, he was John Unitas of the Baltimore Colts. Instead of a revolver, a football was his tool of justice, and he rarely missed his mark. And I must face that deadly killer. Posing the sheriff was the two-gun killer. He might be Billy the Kid or Jesse James. He stalked the violent world of pro football in the form of Sam Huff, the middle linebacker of the New York Giants, and the most feared quarterback killer in the game. The setting could have been Hangman's Hill or OK Corral, but it was Yankee Stadium 1958. The Giants and the Colts in the championship game. Four 
innings of regulation play, the game was tied at 17 all. For the first time, the championship would be decided in an extra sudden death period. The Sheriff and the Villain in pro football's most famous showdown. champions, the good guy wins, and pro football has been true to the heroic image of its time. In John Unitas, America had a new sports idol, and it was a new America that idolized him, the America of television. All right, 60 on four on the ISO. TV thrust pro football into millions of American homes. Sundays became an electronic orgy of plugged-in passes and turned-on touchdowns. not only in helmets and hip pads, but in all shapes, sizes, and disguises. Faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. The pro game in the pop age had a number of superstars, but only one superman, and he was Jim Brown. It is unlikely that anyone will ever again run as far or as well. While the game moved through the pop age, the Green Bay Packers remained in the Ice Age, their rich tradition of victory frozen under a glacier of defeat. In 1958, Green Bay hired Vince Lombardi as head coach. He brought fire to the Ice Age and brought pride back to the Packers. If you look at this play, what we're trying to get is a seal here and a seal here and try to run this play in the alley. In his first year, Lombardi gave the Packers respectability. His second year, the Western title. His third, the World Championship. As America pointed its sights toward a new frontier, the Packers launched pro football into the space age. Thousands of people here in the stands and there are millions of people on television and everyone looking and all with speculation to see what kind of a game the Green Bay Packers are going to play today. Right? right, right. I want you to be proud of your profession. It's a great profession. You be proud of this game and you can do a great deal for football today. Great deal for all the players and the league and everything else. Go out there and play this ball game like I know you can play it. <laughs> January 15, 1967, the game blasted into a new orbit, 
65 million spectators, the largest single viewing audience in the history of sport, watched Lombardi's Packers play the Kansas City Chiefs in the first Super Bowl game. Lombardi wins, but most important, the game wins. On a Super Sunday, pro football becomes America's Super Game. In its 50th year, pro football remains an expression of America. No player fits the accepted pattern of the 60s better than Joe Namath. He has defied coaches, curfews, and conventions, but stands unchallenged as the game's most celebrated player and its finest passer. He is only 26.